And here at Amiibo, we help local groups like yours implement programs that nurture entrepreneurship, prevent the displacement of locally owned businesses, and build more prosperous and equitable local economies. So you're definitely in the right place. Um, this April, Amiibo will host its inaugural Move Your Money Month, urging community members to bank local and invest local. So who better to kick off Move Your Money Month than Michael Schumann? Uh, Michael is an economist, an attorney, an author, an entrepreneur, and a leading visionary on community economics. He's an adjunct professor at Bard Business School in New York City, and also he serves as a senior researcher for Council Fire, carrying out economic development analyses for state, local governments, and businesses across North America. So thank you, Michael, so much for being here, and please do take it away. Thank you so much, Jen, and thanks to the rest of you for taking a little time out of your day and uh, joining us. I have a couple of big objectives in the next hour. One is, I know some of you come really well informed on this topic and others of you are beginners. So I'm just gonna throw a lot of information at you and hopefully there will be some useful morsels there. And I'm gonna to try to leave 10, 15 minutes at the end for questions, discussion. So write down any questions you have, you can put them in the chat and Jen will pick them up or you can just uh, unmute yourself a little bit later and we can talk. One of my other objectives for doing this is that Jen and I have been putting on deeper dive workshops around the country. Uh, we've done them in Rhode Island, in New Hampshire, Alaska, we're about to do one in Washington state. And if in your region, there's a desire to do a deeper dive, uh, let us know. And this is really just a taste of what you'll be getting. So let me uh, share my screen here. And can you folks see my slides? Excellent, thank you. So ABCs of local investing, how you can help your community to flourish. I think the context that we're approaching this topic is that we have been through hell over the last three years with COVID-19. Lots of closures of businesses, lots of financial stress, and even with a lot of government relief programs, the relief for many small businesses was too little, too late. And I believe one of the things that we can do to help businesses is to meet their capital needs locally through various kinds of investment crowdfunding. Now, this is a group that, because it was called together by Amoeba, you, there's probably a fairly good consensus that locally owned business matters, but I thought it would be useful just in a couple of slides to revisit the reasons why it matters. Uh, so this is a study done in Seattle 2017, comparing how money moves through the central co-op, a uh, grocery co-op in Seattle versus a similarly sized chain grocer. And what you can see is that the probability of money sticking in the community after the expenditure in the co-op is about twice as much as in a grocery co-op. And the multiplier effect of that is so significant that if you were to replace the central co-op with a chain grocer, Seattle would lose about 150 jobs because of the loss in that multiplier effect. And there have been a bunch of these studies done in the last 20 years comparing similar businesses, uh, one local, one non-local, or comparing industries. And they all basically show that the local business or industry is going to generate two to four times the jobs and other economic development impacts as the non-locally owned business or industry. Uh, this is from the Harvard Business Review in the summer of 2010. The title says more small firms means more jobs. It's a regression analysis of communities across the United States 
and shows that in those communities with the highest density of locally owned business, there is the highest per capita job growth rate. And this study from the Federal Reserve in 2013 looked at counties across the United States and found that in those counties with the highest density of locally owned business, there is the highest per capita income growth rate. So in other words, if you want to reduce poverty, raise levels of social equality, locally owned businesses are your best ticket for doing so. And there's lots of other reasons that we know why local businesses are really important for community prosperity. Uh, smart growth, creating walkable communities means mixing together smallish, localish businesses with residential patterns. Tourists are drawn to businesses reflecting the unique DNA of your community, and that drives the tourist dollar. Entrepreneurship is led by locally owned businesses. There's a public health literature that shows that locally owned food businesses are contributing to reductions of type two diabetes and obesity. And there's a political science literature that shows that local business communities have higher rates of participation and volunteership and voting. So really, you know, we could spend all day just on this, a very long list of reasons why we want to support our local businesses. And this, of course, is the reason why Amoeba exists and gets stronger, I think, by the day. I have used this typology for many years to think about the categories of support, the categories of activity we undertake to nurture local businesses. To make it easy to remember, I give them all P words, planning people, partners, purse, purchasing, and policy making. Planning means identifying leaks in your economy, all the places where people are unnecessarily buying outside goods and services, and developing a plan to plug those leaks. And what better way to plug them with the people, the entrepreneurs who are leading the leak plugging businesses? Partners means putting together networks of businesses, perhaps through a local business alliance in your community, so that these businesses are more competitive as a team than working on their own. Purse means tapping local savings, whether short-term savings in banks or long-term savings in pension funds and putting them to work in local businesses. Purchasing is about buy local or local first campaigns, and policymaking is really anything that your government does and trying to get them to treat local businesses fairly compared to all the other businesses they're giving tax breaks to. Now, when I talk with business groups, inevitably, the feedback I get from them, even in normal times, is that the biggest issue is purse, that they are trying to get capital. And I think as a result of COVID-19, this need is even greater. So a little bit of background about the capital system in the United States. This is from data of the Federal Reserve in 2018. The numbers have actually grown a little bit since then, but just to keep things uh, memorable and accurate, I'll give you the 2018 data. The total amount of assets that households and nonprofits, but really it's mostly households had, uh, was over $100 trillion. Now to put uh, this $100 trillion into context, our gross domestic product is hovering around 20 trillion dollars a year. So a couple of things about this, you know, a big chunk is what people have in their housing, uh, tangible assets. I mean, some's in computers and other equipment you have around the house, but it's mostly, it's mostly housing. Banks are about $10 trillion or a little bit more. So, you know, those of us who think, ah, if I just get 
everyone to localize all of their investment in local banks and credit unions. I've done the job. No, you've affected only a tiny piece of the financial universe because there is a huge chunk here, what we call securities. And securities are pieces of paper that people issue with rate of return associated with it, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, pension funds, insurance funds. These total $56 trillion in 2018. Now, if we had more time, I would explain data to you that would show you that depending on how you define local, local businesses account for between 60 and 80% of the jobs and the output in a typical slice of our economy. You would expect in a healthy capital system that 60 to 80% of this $56 trillion would be going into local business. And that brings me to this slide here. Now, since we're not in the same room, I can't easily ask this question to all of you, but I often ask people by show of hands, how many of you have at least 1% of your savings in locally owned business? And the depressing answer is, is that even in an event organized by Amoeba, there would be surprisingly few hands up in the air. And what it means is that all of us are systematically over-investing in Fortune 500 companies and under-investing and frankly not investing at all in locally owned business. So we are our biggest problem. Part of this problem is not that we don't want to invest in local businesses, it's that we organized securities laws back in the 1930s and 1940s around this system of accredited and non-accredited investors. So if you're Gordon Gecko, if you're in the top 5% of the country in income and wealth, you're pretty much allowed to invest in anyone, anytime, no questions asked. But if you are in the other 95%, the unaccredited class, you cannot put a penny into a local business until that business has done a lot of legal work, disclosure documents. Now, historically, this legal work could easily cost a business $25,000, $50,000. With those kinds of costs, no wonder very few local businesses wanted to take money from grassroots investors. If we could fix this capital market failure, if we could get 60 to 80% of that $56 trillion into our communities from Wall Street to Main Street, it would amount to an additional amount of money of about $100,000 per capita. So take your population of your community, multiply by $100,000. And that's, that's the treasure at the end of the rainbow uh, that can support us. You don't need perfection in order to achieve a lot of success here. So this is a study that I did in Metro Cleveland with two other people in 2010 called the 25% shift. And it was looking at what would be the impacts of moving 25% of Metro Cleveland's food expenditures from non-local food to local food. And we found that just that change would create 27,000 new jobs paying almost $900 million. And it would create an additional $126 million in state and local taxes. Now, to get to a 25% shift, you would need to create a lot more local food businesses. And 
we calculated that for the 25% shift, we would need about three quarters of a billion dollars invested in local food businesses. Now that sounds like a lot of money, but that's this little red stripe on the left here. Three quarters of a billion dollars turned out to be 1% of what Clevelanders have in their bank accounts and one quarter of 1% of what they have in their pension funds. So my point is, is that even a very modest shift of investment dollars, like one or 2% of people's pension funds into local businesses can have enormous economic ramifications for your community. So here's the good news. Back in 2012, a lot of us pushed on this guy, President Obama, uh, to sign something called the Jobs Act, which legalized investment crowdfunding. Uh, I took this picture from the Rose Garden. It was the first and the only time I've been in the Rose Garden. Um, it was an exciting moment. And what the, what the Jobs Act basically said is that any business can now go to a federally licensed website called a portal. It can raise up to a million dollars with very little paperwork. And then any investor, independent of income, can invest up to $2,200 per year. So it took a lot of years for this Jobs Act to be implemented. But in 2016, it finally came out for air. And in the almost six years since, the record has been astonishing. Basically, more than a million Americans have invested more than a billion dollars in nearly 6,000 local businesses. The average business is using investment crowdfunding to raise $300,000. The average investor is putting in $800. The most successful, uh, uh, most successful businesses have been those run by women and people of color. That is precisely those businesses that the conventional marketplace has overlooked or been biased against are the markets that crowdfunding is serving. Crowdfunding has a bunch of different meanings, and I think it's useful to take a step back and give you a little bit of background about this. So there is donation crowdfunding. That's on sites like GoFundMe or Kickstarter. Donations are not regarded as security. So there's literally thousands of these sites out there, and there's very little legal regulation. Another kind of crowdfunding you'll find out there is from Kiva. So Kiva supports small businesses in the United States and sometimes internationally. People put money into Kiva businesses. They get the principal back, but without interest. And since it, you are not getting a return on your investment, that also is not regarded as a security. So no legal problems with that. There are peer-to-peer -peer lending sites like the Lending Club or Prosper. They are securities. These sites have done a lot of legal work. And you as an individual or sometimes an individual supporting a business can find loans on these sites for thirty-five dollars to $50,000. And people investing in other people like this are making 9 10%, although there's a high default rate. But what we're talking about is something a little bit different. Investment crowdfunding is a very specific piece of law and regulation that allows a business to issue almost any kind of security to outside investors. And that security can be in the form of debt, equity, a convertible note, it could be a royalty agreement where a percentage of the profits or the gross revenues are paid out. Or if you go to a website like a portal like WeFunder, 
you'll find things that are called safe notes, which are basically uh, investments in future equity. Uh, and we can talk about what that means uh, in the Q&A period if anyone is interested. Now, I do want to point out that local investment means more than just investing in a business. And in fact, when you broaden local investment to a lot of activities that we don't even think of as local investment, but, it, but they are, we realize how easy it is for us to become a bigger local investor. So let's start with number one, yourself. Investing in yourself, since you are local to yourself, is a way of investing locally. And getting yourself out of credit card debt, for example, where you're paying 18, 19% per year if you're not in any hot water, if you invest to get yourself out of credit card debt, you get an 18 or 19% rate of return. And that money is coming back into your community locally rather than going to outside creditors. You can do the same thing with family and friends, investing in your kids to get them out of student loan debt. You can invest in your local nonprofit. Now, you can't invest in stock in a nonprofit, but you could have a conversation with your church or your favorite uh, fraternal organization and say, how about we buy you a building? Because a building is often a third or more of the expenses of a nonprofit. You could put your money into a community investment fund. You could put your money into municipal bonds. The state of Connecticut, uh, a few months back, issued what they called green micro bonds to support solar energy expansion. And they issued these bonds in denominations as small as $1,000 and invited residents in, New in Connecticut to buy up the bonds. There was so much demand for this, they were sold out in 48 hours, $25 million of bonds. Think about all of the initiatives your city can do in stormwater management, in renewable energy, in trying to promote affordable housing. And these are all things we could issue municipal bonds around and make those local investment opportunities. Your local bank is also a form of local investment. And then real estate, local real estate is becoming an increasingly common form of local investment. This guy here is named Roger Dick. He is the president of the Wari Bank in Albemarle, North Carolina. He's one of my favorite bankers. And he was co-financing a project to convert an old hotel in his community into an affordable housing and mixed development project. Uh, it was about a $3 million project between the bank and some deep pocket investors. They had about 2 million of that covered. Where did they get the other million? Crowdfunding. They worked with a crowdfunding site called Vicinity Capital, which specializes in crowdfunding in the Carolinas, and successfully put together the deal. And this, I think, is a very exciting way to think about local investment, which is you take the layers of investment that are familiar to us, banks and accredited angels, and then you put together some of the more exotic stuff in crowdfunding, and voila, you have perhaps the magic amount that you're trying to raise. And whether or not it's correct, I think a lot of investors perceive real estate as a safer investment than a business, because if a business goes belly up, you know, you get nothing. But if a piece of real estate goes belly up, chances are good there's some residual value there. What are the goals of local investing? Well, local investing is really about achieving three different kinds of goals, a high social return, a high private return, and manageable levels of risk. By social return, I mean the fact that 
all things being equal, suppose you have two investments, one investment in a local restaurant, one investment in McDonald's supporting non-local restaurants all over the world. And you have, after careful analysis, come to the conclusion that the rate of return is identical, the risk is identical, where should you put your money? I think for all of us, it's a no-brainer that you would put your money into the local business. Because with the local business, because of that multiplier effect we talked about, there are all kinds of benefits happening to your community. All of those increases in employment and tax dollars lead to beautification of your community. It leads to better schools. It leads to lower crime. So that social return is something you cannot ever get out of a publicly traded company. But what about the private return and what about the risk? So let's talk about each of those. Private return. If you spend a lot of your time listening to AM radio, which I often do on Saturdays, you will hear people like Rick Edelman with shows like The Truth About Money. And if you listen to them, they will say, leave your money in the stock market, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, you'll get a 12.5% rate of return or 15% or 20%. All of these numbers, honestly, are cherry-picked and largely made up. And if you want a serious number on the rate of return of the stock market, go to Robert Schiller, professor of economics at Yale, Nobel Prize winner, author of the great book, The Irrational Exuberance, and also author of the Case Schiller uh, Index on housing prices. Schiller on his website has the rates of return every month of the S&P going back more than 100 years. And what you can see is that if you give due credit uh, to dividends and you take away inflation, in any 12-month period up to today, the average rate of return has been 8%. Now, 8% is still a big number. And I think that number actually needs to be understood with a bunch of footnotes. So one footnote is that usually there's a transaction cost. There's a fee associated with all of your trading in the stock market. So if you look at your mutual fund statement, chances are good they're taking about 1% per year. So that knocks it down to 7%. Second thing, we are at the historic high of the stock market. And if you did a measurement from, say, the early 2000s, that rate of return would be closer to 5%. So what goes up comes down. Third thing to keep in mind, none of us have the miraculous ability to come in and out of the market perfectly timed. Because of those reasons, I think that the expectation for a local investor, if you want to beat Wall Street with your local investor investment, your expectation should be closer to 5% rather than 8 Now, 5% is still a formidable number. But if I take 5% as my goal, there are a lot of local investments that are clearly going to deliver a better return than Wall Street. I already mentioned credit card debts running at 18, 19%. Student loan debts are at 8 or 9% these days. In almost any scenario, investing in your house is going to deliver a better return than Wall Street. One reason is at the end of owning your house, you get up to a quarter of a million dollars, um, half a million dollars as a couple tax-free, whereas at the end of your IRA, you're taxed. Energy efficiency is going to deliver much more than a 5% rate of return. Lots of real estate investment sites out there are delivering closer to a 10% rate of return. A lot of co-ops are borrowing money from their members at 6 7 
Now, there are a lot of businesses and options out there that are paying less than 5%. And honestly, I would say the typical business investment you're going to find out there is probably going to pay you closer to 3 or 4%. Same with nonprofits, same with community funds, the municipal bonds we're talking about. Um, those bond rates are going up a little bit, but they've been hovering around 3 or 4%. And banks, of course, are 1% or smaller. But here's the reason why I am optimistic. This is uh, one of the most recent data sets I could find on the profitability of businesses in North America. So it comes from that strange neighbor to the north of us called Canada. And what these data show is that the most profitable businesses are those with 10 to 20 employees. The least profitable businesses are those traded on the Toronto Stock Exchange with over 500 employees. I have no reason to believe it's any different in the United States. And the reason why local businesses are paying lower rates of return is not that they're less profitable, it's that the whole market for local investment is tremendously immature now. And it is expensive, and difficult to gather information. This will change, and you are part of that change. What about risk? So if you were to ask your investment advisor, hey, I've got this restaurant down the street from me. Uh, it's been doing really well for 10 years. They're opening up a second restaurant about 10 miles away from here. Should I support that restaurant? Chances are very good that your investment advisor will say, don't you dare, because most local businesses fail. Now, your investment, your registered investment advisor has just made one of the most common and frankly pernicious forms of mistakes. It is not true that most local businesses fail. It's true that most local businesses, startups fail. Startups are 5% of the local business community. And when you're looking at a startup, yes, those are highly risky. But if you're looking at the other 95% and you're looking at a restaurant that has been around, in my hypothetical, it's been around for 10 years, does well, proven business model, good management, it is not that risky. That said, there are some unique risks that local businesses carry. One of them is if you're looking to invest in local businesses, you have fewer businesses to look at, your chance of choosing wrong is much greater. There's also the issue of a local business cycle. If you create a portfolio of local businesses, um, and your community has a downturn, and maybe that downturn is not connected to the ups and downs of the national economy. Maybe a couple of big businesses have left town. All of your securities are gonna suffer. And those are real risks of local investment. But if you're gonna have a fair assessment of the risks, it's also useful to look at the other side of the equation. And we know that there are certain features about local businesses that make them less risky things to invest in. For example, you have better information about local businesses than you do about Fortune 500 companies because you have the ability to test out the goods and services, to talk with the management and talk with the workforce. And if they're not answering your questions to your satisfaction, don't invest. But that ground truth thing, community banks have told us and shown us, leads to a lower risk of failure than just relying on computerized risk assessments. There is the social return that we've talked about already. And if you're getting a social return, well, we don't know exactly what that number is, but it's something. And that, in a way, puts less pressure 
on the private return you need from this business. Another feature of local businesses is that investors are not just passive investors. Investors in a local business are often consumers. Think of people who invest in their grocery co-op. They shop there even if there are deals down the street. They're evangelists for the co-op. They're great marketers for the co-op. That kind of dynamic actually improves the chances of that business ultimately succeeding. What about finding local investments? How do you find them? Well, one way to find it find, is to talk with um, your local business people. So if you have a chamber of commerce, if you have a local business alliance, usually there's some knowledge about what local businesses either are looking for money or might be looking for money. Another thing you might do is talk with your small business development center, or if there are small business programs at the community college. Another thing you might do is set up a group. And I was pleased to see that on this phone call, uh, there was at least one person from a Lion group. So Lion was a concept set up by this guy on the right, James Fraser in Port Townsend, Washington in 2007. Lion stands for Local Investment Opportunity Network. And what James has done is, you know, what he launched is a kind of potluck dinner that brought together local businesses and local investors, and they just formed relationships with one another. Now, if James had done other things like um, created speaker series or created an organized distribution of business plans, he would have legal problems. But just putting together a social network had no legal problems associated with it. And this legal, this social network in a 10,000 person town has led to about $800,000 per year in new investment going into locally owned businesses in Port Townsend. That's how important these social relationships really are. And I'm pleased to say that the Washington uh, State Department of Commerce has been supporting the spread of lions across Washington State, particularly in rural communities. In Baltimore, Maryland, a colleague and I set up a website called the Maryland Neighborhood Exchange. And what we did is we just created a website where we listed businesses in Baltimore that were looking for money. So that if you're a local investment in Bal investor in Baltimore and want to know like what's hot and what's available, you just go to the Maryland Neighborhood Exchange and check it out. And here's some remarkable data. Um, in the year and a half that the exchange has really been operating, um, and by the way, we don't do any transactions. We just send people to the federally licensed portals where they do their deals. We have helped 44 mostly BIPOC-led businesses raise $3.3 million from 6,000 investors. So information is exceedingly important. And there is no reason why any of you could not put up a site like this tomorrow in your community to facilitate investment crowdfunding. And if you're interested in a sort of national inventory of crowdfunding opportunities, there is a nice site out there called Investibule, and it offers you types of businesses, it offers you states, and you can do a search through the 80 plus crowdfunding portals to find out what you might be interested in putting your money into. How do you evaluate local investments? Well, I think one of the key things is working together as a group because you have to do intelligence gathering. 
you have to do reconnaissance. You have to ask businesses that you might be interested in lots of questions about the risks and the returns and the kind of security they're offering. You also have to reflect on liquidity. And by liquidity, I mean, when you put an investment in a business, how quickly do you need that investment back in terms of cash? So if you're a young person, you could probably put an investment in and not need it for 10 years. If you're 80 years old and you need that money for retirement, you might have higher liquidity needs. So one of the things that I do in these deep dive investment workshops is I ask people to reflect on their own personal stage of life. What is your level of risk that you're willing to take on? What is the level of liquidity? And create an idealized portfolio broken down into you know, low risk, low liquidity, high risk, high liquidity categories, and then evaluate how does this compare to where your money is now? And that will give you some insight in what your ability to invest more of your money locally really is. There is one other challenge that people face in local investment, and that is that most of our savings are in tax deferred accounts. They could be 401ks in our workplace. They could be in IRAs that we've set up. The problem is, is that 99.9% of 401ks and IRAs will only give you non-local publicly traded stocks and bonds to choose from for your investments. How can I tap, how can you tap those tax deferred dollars for local investing? Well, this is the subject of my most recent book, Put Your Money Where Your Life Is. And the two secret weapons you want to know about are the self-directed IRA and the solo 401k. With a self-directed IRA, you can hire an outside custodian from one of maybe 200 companies It'll cost you, if you shop around, to say rocket dollar, uh, $250 a year. And you basically tell that custodian where you want your tax-deferred money to go to. Um, and that custodian has to follow your directions, and you could do local reinvestment that way. Another alternative is the solo 401k. This was designed primarily for self-employed people. But one of the things you can do with a solo 401k is you don't need to hire a custodian. You just need to create your own dedicated bank account in your own bank. And you administer the checks that come in and out of businesses yourself. And to set up a solo 401k, there's about 50 companies out there, many of them law firms, that will sell you an agreement with the IRS called a prototype. And that will cost you $300 for a six year rental of that agreement. And again, Rocket Dollar is a good example of a company that will give you this on the cheap. Now, as I said, a solo 401k requires that you be a self-employed, but it doesn't mean you don't have a day job. You can have a day job that's you know paying you on salary, someone else is paying you on salary. And then at night, you've got a little home-based business on eBay and you are self-employed with respect to that money from eBay. So if you have $1 of income from that self-employed business, you can set up a solo 401k. All things taken together, it is a lot better to have a solo 401k than a self-directed IRA. Why? It's cheaper to create a solo 401k. You have checkbook control over the money moving in and out. You don't have to deal with the hassle of communicating with this uh, custodian. You're allowed to put a lot more money in every year. So with an IRA or a self-directed IRA, you can put in six or 7,000 a year, depending on your age. With a solo 401k, 
there are scenarios in which you can put in more than $120,000 in a given year. And another powerful thing about a solo 401k that's not true of a self-directed IRA is that you can give yourself a loan. You can give yourself a loan of up to $50,000 or half of what's in your account, whichever is less. Um, and that loan you can use for anything. You can pay off your credit cards. You can pay off your house mortgage. You can pay off your kid's student debt. And then you pay yourself back at a tiny interest rate. So this is a very powerful tool of local investment. And to put this together, I think the magic formula for all of us who want to become active local investors is to set up a solo 401k and then roll over our existing 401ks when we quit, resign, or retire from our day jobs. If you're interested in learning more about solo 401ks or self-directed IRAs, I encourage you to join the next day where there's several hundred people working through the details of all of this. A couple of words about for those of you who are thinking of using crowdfunding to support your business. Crowdfunding isn't for everyone. Um, and there are some serious questions that you need to ask yourself before you decide to go down this path. Among the questions, how comfortable are you with taking on more debt? How comfortable are you with having a bunch of other people involved in your business that might take away some of your control? How comfortable are you administering an ownership scheme with hundreds or thousands of people? Another set of questions is, are you ready for investment? My sense is, is that the companies that do best with crowdfunding are not blue sky companies. They are companies that actually have existing sales and existing fans. And companies with solid growth plans, companies with really good boards, companies that have done their books. Because one of the things that you have to do before you do crowdfunding, you don't necessarily need to do an audit, but you do need to have your books ready in a presentable form. Another thing that you'll need for crowdfunding is a fan base. Now, it doesn't need to be huge. In the Maryland Exchange, we've got plenty of companies with a couple of hundred people in their fan base, and they've been able to raise ten to $25,000. But if you're raising hundreds of thousands, and by the way, you can now raise up to $5 million as a company in investment crowdfunding. If you're going to raise in the millions of dollars, you better have thousands of people in your fan base. Next steps. As I said at the top of this talk, my hope is that all of you will consider two things. One thing is maybe taking one of the deep dive workshops uh, that Jen and I have organized, and we have got a workshop coming up in Washington State. It begins in the first week of April. We meet once a week for 90 minutes, and then in between people watch 15 deep dive videotapes that I've prepared on all of these topics. Basically, you got a taste of the top lines of all of these videotapes uh, in the last 45 minutes. The other thing that you might think about is maybe you want to organize a workshop for people in your community, and we can help you raise money and put these things together. Uh, and usually there's one core organization that is energetic about this, and then we put things together from that. So I think with that said, um, we've got about 10 minutes and maybe a little bit of change, if Jen is generous, uh, to answer questions. So let's open it up. I can start. There's a question. Marianne Miller from Stay Local had to leave early, but she wanted to uh, make sure she got a chance to ask this question on microbonds. 
Are they factored in a bond rating? Uh, she'd be interested in being ahead of any argument dissuading a mis municipality um, from them on that point. In New Orleans, um, as I understand it, heavily studying CT Green Bond in the wake of catastrophic infrastructure failure during a 2021 hurricane. Um, she was just looking or for a tornado kind of, from yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> Any kind of argument on, on that, getting ahead of that that argument. Yeah. So um, I mean, these are the, these need to be evaluated like other kinds of bonds. Um, and so, you know, the evaluation you'll make on the infrastructure side. Um, but I think that a lot of um, a lot of solar investments, a lot of renewable energy investments, a lot of stormwater investments have pretty, pretty certain payoffs. I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, so I, I recently did a project for the Department of Public Works in Baltimore on stormwater management. And, you know, they, there are penalties that they will clearly have to pay if they don't increase their level of stormwater management at a certain rate. And so that creates effectively a price premium the city is willing to pay on bonds to undertake some of this stormwater management work. And so as long as there is a certainty of payments, uh, whether it's in stormwater management or solar implementation, you can make a good case for bond coverage. Great. Looks like Mariah, you have a question. You can unmute yourself and ask away. Thank you. Uh, hi, Michael. My name is Mariah McKay, and I'm the Director of Dynamism at the Spokane Independent Metro Business Alliance in Eastern Washington State. Um, I think there's a really interesting kind of co-location of a lot of new economy, solidarity economy, thinkers and doers in our part of the country. And um, I'm very much a, a child and a descendant of that. Um, and you've been working for decades here and your work kind of pushed me into this work. So I'm a, a very strange kind of chicken that's coming home to roost, a, you know, another decade and a half later. Um, so- My daughter, my long lost daughter. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, we're gonna have some fun uh, going forward, let me tell you. Um, and so I have a pretty abstract question. Um, Totally excited to buy your book. Uh, I've been yearning to figure out how to get my finances in alignment with my values and what I'm preaching um, in our network. And um, my question is about how, so our organization is structured as a nonprofit. Um, we do provide some for-profit services. We sell tickets to events. You know, we have membership revenue. We do contracts. We do grants. Um, and we have a, a pretty ambitious vision for economic systems transformation at the local level in our region. And um, as a nonprofit organization, uh, we struggle to participate in the upside of the business technical assistance we provide to our members and to the broader community. And I'm wondering, um, is there, are, are there ways for us to, how do I put this? Um, basically, if we provide technical assistance to a startup that makes them successful, um, can we have an agreement, like a future equity agreement as a nonprofit and our TA clients um, to actually see some revenue from the private market back to our operational budget so we can hire more staff and organize the LIN and organize the, you know, all the different tools that we don't have right now um, because the granting landscape and the philanthropy landscape is very difficult to fund the kind of work that we do and that we know we need to do more of. Um, so are, are, have you thought of creative ways for nonprofit organizational investing in this kind of landscape? Yes, so a couple, a couple of thoughts. Um, one is that um, a, a small group of us associated with a group called NC3, National Coalition for Community Capital, put together a handbook on community investment funds about a year and a half ago, uh, and you can download that for free. And there's a pretty nice legal section there written by Brian Beckin of Cutting Edge Capital that outlines all of the exemptions 
um, in the Investment Company Act that you can take advantage of to create fund-like activities in support of businesses. Um, so the combination, ah, I see Mika Fisher is here, great. Um, so the, combi the, the combination of uh, technical assistance and capital that you're providing could fit into one of these exemptions. And you'll read through the handbook and you'll see exactly you know, what the requirements are. But here's the thing. Even if it doesn't fit into your nonprofit, you have a plan B. And plan B is create a for-profit subsidiary to the nonprofit that does this kind of structure. But uh, there are a lot of examples in the handbook of community funds that have been set up within nonprofits to support uh, local businesses. And nonprofits is one of the biggest and most used exemptions within the Investment Company Act. So um, I would say, look at the handbook, uh, give Brian a call at some point. Uh, and uh, also there are other resources that NC3 has and Mika can share with you the website for NC3 on putting together funds like this. I see Colin has an easy, straightforward question. Colin Murray from Dean by Local. It just, how do I start a Maryland exchange program in my community? Well, um, I'll, I will uh, let you know that I am um, been working on a version 2.0 of the Maryland Exchange called Small Street. Um, and the idea is just to give every community some simple turnkey software that they can put together a Maryland Exchange-like program in their community. So if you just subscribe to, so I have this um, newsletter that's also affiliated with NC3 called the Main Street Journal. And if you just uh, become a subscriber of that, and maybe Mika, you can put in the link for that and it's a Substack thing. Uh, I'll let you know when uh, Small Street is ready and then we can talk Turkey. Other questions, comments? You said there were lots of examples of the um, community fund nested under a nonprofit. What are some examples, maybe not national examples, but smaller scale, more regionalized examples that we could take a look at to get inspiration? Yeah, so all of the, all, all of the um, examples we looked at in the handbook are local. They, they, they're not national efforts. Um, here's the thing. If we, so there are maybe 10,000 funds in the United States and nearly all of them are allocated, are, are focused on publicly traded or large scale stocks and bonds, almost all of them. So the numbers of funds that are focused on a community and allow unaccredited investors to participate is about 20. The most established examples um, that have been around for 20 years are the New Hampshire Community Loan Fund, which has done great work, the Vermont Community Loan Fund, the Mountain Biz Works Fund. Uh, there are some funds with uh, ECDI, which is a nonprofit in Columbus, Ohio, but the ones we looked at in the handbook are more recent. So like the Ujima and Boston Impact Funds, which support BIPOC businesses. Uh, the, um, let's see, we also talk about PV Grows, Pioneer Valley Grows, which is a, a fund supporting local food businesses in Western Massachusetts. We have the East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative in uh, the San Francisco Bay Area. So, so there's, but honestly, these funds just scratch the surface of what's possible out there. Um, so I think, think about 
how to get a finance arm of your business going in support of everything else you're doing. All right, let's go to Anonymous. Who is Anonymous with their <laughs> hand up? You got it. Whoops. We are not hearing you, Anonymous. Hi, this is Anonymous, but I don't have my hand up, I don't think. Sorry. All right, so oh, other Anonymous. Anonymous your... so... <laughs> <laughs> oh, we can't hear you. I don't know if you can type in your question. So, so Jen, I'm happy to go a few minutes over if it's okay with you. Absolutely. If folks have to leave, we understand, but we'd love to, to get more questions answered. Um, so, well, how about the anonymous we could hear from, the second anonymous? Why don't you just speak your question? I didn't have a question, but thank you. Oh. I enjoyed this. This was good and very valuable. And I didn't know about the uh, 401k, so I'm going to check that out. I'm a business owner and an investor. so Both sides of the equation. Great. Absolutely. Yeah, so thank um, you. Anonymous, should we try you again? Uh, well, I still can't hear. I know you're unmuted, according to our yeah. software, but um, maybe we can go to Genevieve and Anonymous one, if you want to put your, your question in the chat, I'll be sure to read it out loud for you. Oh, I think we, we've got Anonymous. I'm Carrie from Seattle. Um, hard, uh, how hard is it to convert a self-directed IRA to a solo 401k? Thanks, Carrie. Um, it, it's only slightly more difficult than a flick of a switch. Um, so, you know, you set up your, your self-directed IRA, and then depending on the company that you've set it up with, uh, they have the administrative apparatus for conversion. Um, it's more difficult to do a workplace 401k, but, but the IRA is very easy to convert. Great. Um, Genevieve, do you want to answer or ask a question? Actually, I just wanted to make a comment. First, Michael, thank you as always for your brilliance and your commitment to this ongoing conversation about local investing. I just think it's essential and very important. And I also want to remind people that CDFIs don't have the 5% return, but they're doing very important work and they do have small returns and it's a better place to park your cash usually i mean check it out because some there are uh, there are limitations but there are um, opportunities for a little bit higher return than you would get at a big bank savings account so just wanted to put that out great thank you and isaac um he has a, have you ever considered bringing your ideas or thinking to Main Street America or local Main Street programs? Um, historically, I've done a lot of work with Main Street programs, not in the last couple of years, but yeah, I think, I think it's, um, I, I mean, there are literally hundreds of Main Street programs or at least the remnants of once active Main Street programs all over the country. Um, I do think that there's, a special value in putting together Main Street ideas, that is placemaking ideas with local finance. Um, and too often, you know, Main Street ideas get kind of captured with big money and big developers, and they then are using these big tax breaks like opportunity zones. And the rest of us are kind of bewildered about how this all happens around us. But I think local finance really gives us the opportunity to do the shaping of placemaking as, as we want to do it. 
Great, and I see Mariah hands her hand up. I just wanted to get one last question. Um, Kimberly, how can I find CDFIs? There, so there is, um, there are a bunch of national lists, but CDFIs are administered, I think by a, a, a branch of the Department of Treasury and there's a CDFI department and you can get a comprehensive list there. Um, just so you know, a CDFI, Community Development Financial Institution, is a designation that uh, you can get if you're working in a low-income community or you're working with a, a critical mass of uh, you know, entrepreneurs who are women or people of color or lack resources. Um, and... If you are focused on those clients and you get the CDFI designation, you are able to get preferential access uh, to equity capital and debt capital and loan guarantees and other services from the federal government. Um, and you could be a financial institution like a bank or a credit union, or you could be a fund, or you could just be a technical support provider. All of these categories are capable of getting a CDFI designation. Mariah, go right ahead and ask your question. Um, thank you. So this is such a timely combination of circumstances and realizations. So we actually had two um, colleagues of mine, entrepreneurs in my community who were trying to round up funds to start a community investment fund basically. And one of them got a high paid job at a, a local uh, public development authority in our university district. And the other one decided he was gonna go it alone and create a cooperative holding company. So the two talented peers of mine who were gonna do this thing um, but not in relation to my organization, um, ended up going their own ways. And so maybe it's up to us to figure out how to create this subsidiary fund you've talked about. And so um, we had a grant through our Department of Financial Institutions at our state level for uh, financial education, which I thought could potentially be used um, to pay someone to educate people about these local investment strategies. Unfortunately, I got feedback that the grant was more about educating low-income folks how to save in their bank accounts, which is much less dynamic um, of a strategy than what we want to get funded. So you said, think about how to start this program, and I'm sure it's probably in the handbook and I need to read that, but can you give us a taste of, well, another thing is I reached out to the wealth managers, you know, independent businesses in my community and said, would you like to start a LIN with us? And they were, they were like, no, we can't. We have you know, restrictions, um, we can't participate in things like that professionally because of our licenses. And um, I didn't really know, okay, so I can't, you know, leverage their financial expertise. Who, who are the kinds of professionals we're looking for in terms of HR and talent acquisition here? And what are some sources of funding to help pay for their time to help bootstrap um, these capacities? Yeah, I, I wish I had a good answer to your last question. Um, because I have tried to convince a bunch of different communities with a bunch of different kinds of institutions uh, to get involved deeper in this. And it's hard. It's hard to convince communities that it's worth their while. It, I, by, so in this case, I'm talking about local governments. It's hard to convince local governments that it's worth their while to facilitate grassroots investment. I think they'll get it over time, but right now it's just the state of Connecticut with their micro bonds that has kind of gotten the bug, but you, you don't see a lot of other examples around the country. Well, I guess the other example is, as I said, Washington State of Commerce, State, state Department of Commerce getting involved in Lions. Um, I think community banks, could be really important uh, partners in all of this. 
Um, and so I've been very pleased with the partnership that I've had with the guy whose picture I showed you, Roger Dick of the Uari Bank in middle of North Carolina. And I, I think a lot of community banks are figuring out how do they reboot their competitiveness in a tightening market. And this getting involved in the grassroots finance universe could be a way of their doing that. Now, do you mean community um, banks only or community credit unions as well included in yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, I no, I mean, yeah, I meant it more broadly. So, so any locally owned financial institution. And how do you distill the nugget of the value proposition to get them interested in that having that conversation? It's a work in progress. Um, I, I, I think the way that I would there's a couple of different um, strategic points that, that I've tried to make with them. So, so one is you are trying to compete against a variety of big players. How are you different from them? So differentiation around we support local investment in a way that the others don't, that could be very helpful. Another point, if you are a banker, you are giving loans uh, to very safe bets that are collateralized, um, which means most of the time you are saying no to people. By having a crowdfunding program that you are affiliated with, you never have to say no to anybody. You could say, no, you're not ready for a loan, but I'm going to send you down the hall to the people who are managing our crowdfunding activities, and you can talk with them, and maybe if you're successful there, you come back and we'll have another conversation. Um, and still another piece of it is, is that um, banks are, uh, community banks are just looking for new kinds of products, new kinds of activities, um, doing educational courses, for example. I mean, there are lots of community banks that have been doing the kinds of things that you talked about, which is, you know, making people more bankable, um, getting more people to of, you know, very low income to open up bank accounts. This is just another form of financial education that the institution can do to sort of build up a relationship with the community. Looks like we got all the questions, Michael. Great, all right. So um, just a few final, final words. Um, if you are, Interested in the workshops, Jen posted uh, the link to the next workshop we're doing in Washington State. If you're interested in just staying in touch with local investment news, uh, you can check out the Main Street Journal. Um, and uh, we'll, I look forward to seeing many of you in future events. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, everybody, for being here. All right.